All right. The minutes from the March 28, 2024 regular council session have been printed, posted, and circulated. Are there any corrections to the minutes? If there are no objections, then the minutes will stand approved as posted. Uh, the report of the treasurer, you all have received a reconciliation of funds. Uh, the city is very solvent and all of our bills are paid. Uh, Mr. Leach typically gives that report, but since he's not here this evening, I will do it for him. So um, we have no unfinished business this evening. And so we move into our agenda. The first item on our agenda this evening is an ordinance on first reading authorizing the implementation of the Vienna Police Department's Deferred Retirement Option Plan, which is called the DROP Program. Mr. Scott, Ted, you can do yours? Okay, great. <clears throat> you want me to read the whole thing? I think you should. Okay. And by the whole thing, I mean the ordinance and not the, just the just plan the, itself. Just the title page. Okay. Uh, this is an ordinance authorizing implementation of the Vienna Police Department's Deferred Retirement option, Optional Plan. Whereas the City of Vienna and the City of Vienna Police Department has sought to implement, it, implement a Deferred Retirement Optional Plan. Whereas a Deferred Retirement Optional Plan, commonly referred to as a drop, is a mechanism wherein an employee can receive a retirement benefit but continue to work and draw wages. Whereas the City of Vienna and the City of Vienna Police Department seeks to implement a drop that will allow eligible members to receive a retirement benefit based on service and average annual compensation as of the drop participation entry date, continue receiving their wages for the continued employment, accumulate benefits during the drop period in the member's drop account, and participate in such drop for a period that may span from one year to five years, provided that the member completes drop by the age of 65. Whereas drops are permitted under West Virginia Code 82225A, whereas a prerequisite of adopting a drop, the municipality must submit the proposed drop to the West Virginia Municipal Pensions Oversight Board, which in turn will cause the drop to be analyzed by a qualified actuary. Whereas the City of Vienna previously submitted the proposed drop to the West Virginia Municipal Pensions Oversight Board, and whereas by letter dated March 26, 2024, the West Virginia Municipal Pensions Oversight Board notified the City of Vienna that the proposed drop had been approved and indicated that based on information from that board's actuary, indicated that the plan is projected to result in a net gain. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Vienna that the City of Vienna authorizes and adopts the Deferred Retirement Optional Plan for the City of Vienna Policeman's Pension and Relief Fund as approved by the West Virginia Municipal Pensions Oversight Board according to West Virginia Code 82225A. The City of Vienna Police Department and the City of Vienna Policeman's Pension and Relief Funds are authorized to implement such Deferred Retirement Optional Plan. A copy of the Deferred Retirement Optional Plan is attached and made a part of this ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Bibby, can you still hear me, sir? Yes, can. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of an ordinance authorizing implementation of the Vienna Police Department's Deferred Retirement Optional Plan. So moved. Second. It's been moved. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the ordinance authorizing the DROP program. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then would you poll council, please? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Uh, Mr. Azinger? Yeah. Mr. Rapp? Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. All right. The ordinance passes 6 0. Um, thank you all for that because it's going to be a huge asset to the city of Vienna uh, and the police department to have that in place. Um, We've got a, a, one of our senior officers that is ready to retire, and he's interested in this program. So we will not only retain his 27 and a half years of service, but we'll continue to have his leadership on the job. So that's great. The next item on our agenda this evening is a resolution to authorize the purchase of two mid-size or full-size SUVs for the Vienna Police Department using opioid settlement funds. 
be resolved by the Common Council of the City of Vienna that it hereby authorizes the Vienna Police Chief and the City Finance Director to solicit bids for the purchase of two new or used all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive unmarked SUVs. If used, it would require it to be 2020 or newer with less than 40,000 miles. Um, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the resolution authorizing the purchase of two mid-size or full-size SUVs for the Vienna Police Department using opioid settlement funds. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the resolution. Is there any further discussion? And I would like to start this one this evening, okay? Um, last night, I had to go to Harrisville to North Bend State Park for a meeting uh, with the Mayor's Association and several legislators. And Mayor Tom Joyce, who represents our region on the First Foundation, which is the oversight body of all of the opioid funds, made a presentation last night talking about the direction that the opioid fund uh, governing body is going to go. And he brought up several things that I kind of caught me off guard because time goes by so fast, but it has been a year since the First Foundation was put together to settle all of these funds and the distribution of them. And so they like, now they have a panel in place. They have hired a, a, a director. And so things should start to move pretty quickly. They're developing a application form so that any city uh, that has a project that they want to apply for funding can fill out a uniform application to get that done. He went over all of the different categories that this money can be spent on, and there are several. Um, and one of them is obviously law enforcement. And so in the discussion that was held uh, at that meeting, you know, the thing about it is in the last five years, every city has gotten incredible amounts of money through whether it be the CARES Act or the American Rescue Plan funds. And so the point that they're trying to make with this bucket of money that's coming to every city and county is the fact that they want this money to be put to use. They want to try to get ahead, uh, ahead of the game on the opioid problem that we all have. And so for the things that uh, Chief Pfeiffer has asked for, um, I believe that all of these expenditures are well, um, well needed. Uh, it provides the police department with assets that they can use when they go out on various uh, investigations that they're doing. And we've had lots of talks about this. And the thing about this is, you know, we don't know exactly what the amount of money is going to be on this. On the next resolution that comes up, the trailer to haul all of the equipment and what have you is $4,500. But two used vehicles, we don't know what that's going to be yet. But if you use a round number of $50,000, $40,000, $42,000, $44,000 for the vehicles, and um, then the, the trailer, you know, $4,500, it's, you know, somewhere around 50, but that's a guess. And so I would personally like to see us get this money out working in our communities. I am all for the things that Tony talks about. I'm all for the things that Mr. Leach has spoken to numerous times. But the police department, they lead, they carry the flag when we get into these discussions about opioid issues and how the things are going to go. And so Chief Piper, if you have a uh, comment you'd like to make about the need for this equipment, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so I guess when this when this first came out, you know, I, I was thinking of some ways, uh, you know, how can we utilize this stuff? And, and I agree what Tony said and agree what you said, Mayor, and prevention is definitely a part of that. I was a, I was a D.A.R.E. officer for years, um, and there's, a, there's, there's some prevention measures in place right now. Is there more we could do? There always is more we can do. But, you know, when we're talking about proaction and reaction, and generally from the police department, it's a reactive measure. Uh, generally, I come to you all every year with two patrol vehicles, okay? We finally got up to full staff. I know we announced here tonight I'm leaving, but uh, we finally got the full staff. But with, with 21 police officers and a hiring of a civilian investigator, which we look to do here really close in the very near future, uh, it brings challenges to us as well. So we still have to respond 
uh, no matter what we need to do, we have to respond and respond appropriately with, with equipment. So uh, with the trailer, uh, these investigators could haul stuff that they can do for investigations, whether it's an outside crime scene, it could be lighting, it can be generators, it can be all kinds of stuff. I thought that's an in inexpensive way. A trailer should, if we take care of it, last for a pretty long time. Uh, and so vehicles. Uh, vehicles, we're getting, we're pretty thin right now on vehicles. I know we're waiting on two patrol vehicles, but for, for the investigators, I thought this really fit well within the bounds and the rules of this opioid money. I thought it's a way that we could benefit from it in our opioid response. And if it's something that you all feel, uh, the, you know, the, who control the, the money here, if it's not something like we're responding appropriately, we're to bring that forward. It's not personal. We can talk about it, whatever. I talked with Tony actually last week uh, there on some on some prevention things that we are doing now, and maybe he wants to be a part of. And I know Kim and and uh, Melissa has been to the prevention meetings, that, and, and that's what that group's aimed to do. So we, we have some stuff here that we're doing. Could we do more? Yes. And I'm not saying this isn't taking up all the money. This is just some of the money, but I think that the police department should have a seat at that table in our opioid response. And that, that's really my take on it. So um, I wouldn't ask for it if we didn't need it. So I think it's something that we need and something that can help us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I will, I will add something here since we're talking about opioid money. This picture is uh, the dog. I know we talked, this is Tyson. He's about a year old. This is our new dog that you guys approved the first time. So. Officer Polesley uh, will be, I think you see him a little bit better, uh, will be start training with that dog uh, here mid to late May. So he'll be in a several week training regiment uh, with Tyson. But I want to show you that's, that's the new dog. So. so that was the point that I wanted to make about that, Mike. Um, in our first allocation of the OPO money, we got, I believe, $193,000. Correct. And so the dog was about $13,000. So we still have $180,000 left in this first distribution. Yes. Um, Mr. Dietzler, who happens to be in the crowd this evening, is one of the attorneys that represents the city of Vienna through his law firm. And, you know, there is more funds to come from these distributions. Um, if the council members looked at the reconciliation of funds this evening, um, we are carrying a balance of $1.3 million in the American Rescue Plan funds. And we also are carrying $1.6 million of CARE Act funds. And we've had that money for a long time. And we've got projects lined up, but they just haven't been done yet. So, you know, we're sitting on about $3 million of federal money. I would like to see us put the opioid money to work now. We don't have to spend it all. You can tell that we're pretty thrifty because of the money that we've held in reserve for these projects. But of all the departments that we've mentioned this to and all the council people that we've talked about this, Chief Pfeiffer was the only one that came forward with a plan of the needs that he has and thinks will benefit both the city and the department. And so if you all have other projects that you would like to look at, I, I know one of the ones for me is I, I hope that we can find um, – some mental health training for our police officers. I, I, I know that they deal with so many issues when you go out because these people that have uh, drug issues, they're, they do crazy things. And so I would like our officers to get more training so that if they go out, you know, and, and this guy, he's acting, you know, out of his mind, that we would have the ability to help these people. Uh, maybe we can stop some of the, the problems that come out of this. And so, you know, that's just my item that I would like to see us invest in, some better training for our police officers. So anything that you would like to share, please do it, because we will certainly look, in, look into it. All right? Okay, thank you. So, all right, back to discussion. Is there any further discussion? I, I just have a comment. And, and I appreciate... Um, the chief and his comments, and I, he was very generous and allowed me to come in to his office, and we talk a lot about all the different things that we can do, with, that his department can do with the opioid money, and I, I think everybody supports, you know, police dogs and cruisers and trailers and all that stuff, and that's not a question, but the, 
The issue for me is I think we need to sit down and have a broader conversation about what we want to do with this money some, and get more voices at the table. Obviously, yes, we're going to take care of the police department in the ways that we can, but it's a bigger thing. It's about prevention, and we want to see that the, those prevention dollars filter into our community you know, on the people side where they, where they really need to be used. So I'm just asking for a... Um, an actual conversation about it because, you know, this money just continues to be spent, which, like I said, good things, but I think that council, we just need to put our heads together and have some time to figure out how we're going to direct that money most effectively and efficiently. Further comments? All right, then I'll call for the question. If you'll poll council, please. Uh, Ms. Williams. Yes. Mr. Azinger. Yes. Mr. Rapp. Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby. Yes. Mr. Mancuso. Yes. All right. Thank you. The resolution uh, passes unanimously. We'll go to item number three. It's a resolution to purchase a 2024 six by 12 single axle enclosed trailer with two stabilizer jacks. Um, be a resolved by the common council of the city of Vienna that it hereby authorizes the Vienna Police Chief to purchase a 2024 arising 6x12 single axle enclosed trailer with two stabilizer jacks for a total not to exceed $4,550 from Mountaineer Trailer Sales of Vienna, West Virginia using opioid settlement funds. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the resolution. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the resolution. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then I'll have you poll council again. Ms. Williams. Yes. Mr. Azinger. Yes. Mr. Rapp. Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby. Yes. Mr. Mancuso. Yes. The resolution passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda this evening is internal budget revision number six. This is a resolution that uh, does not uh, require any new money. It is simply uh, moving money between line items to cover shortfalls uh, in the line items that are there at the end of the year. Uh, the police department is asking to move money to cover the increase in the investigation expenses. Uh, that is a, a reduction of $3,000. He would like to remove $3,000 from the auto supplies. Uh, $1,500 from materials and supplies, and then that would be a total of $7,500 to be transferred into the investigation expenses line item. The next item is a transfer of $143,000, and that would be transferred over to the salary line item of $140,000. There would also be an addition of uh, FICA of $1,500 and retirement of $1,500. And I have to uh, note on this item right here that uh, the city of Vienna recently closed our old pension plan and went to a new pension plan uh, with the state. And the $143,000 is the savings that we got by doing that. Uh, and so it, it worked out very well. And our pension plan when I came here, I don't know, 10 years ago, as part of the finance committee, the pension plan was worth $5 million. And I set a goal that if we could increase our police pension plan to $10 million while I was here, that I would be happy. And if you noticed on your reconciliation of funds this evening, it now exceeds $13 million. And so our finance director has been super working uh, with our pension plans. And so uh, I'm very proud of those numbers and I know that she is as well. And for all the retirees that we have in our police department, they're one of the top pension plans in the state of West Virginia. So congratulations to our finance director. Um, the next item is a uh, re uh, removal from contract service in the amount of $6,540. Um, this money came because 
Uh, we had a temporary worker budgeted in the in the uh, department, and we did not hire him. And so they would like to transfer that money to the capital outlay uh, equipment line item for the purchase of a new Skag uh, lawnmower. The last item is the uh, contract services line item, and that is to take out $9,250. And that would be spent for $7,300 on salaries, $550 for the FICA, and $1,400 for retirement. And so this is a net uh, zero internal budget revision. It is simply moving money from one line item to another. So I will entertain a motion for the approval of internal budget revision number six. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve internal budget revision number six. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then I'll call for the question. Would you poll counsel, please? Ms. Williams? Yes. Mr. Azinger? Yes. Mr. Rapp? Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. The resolution passes unanimously. So we'll move on to the next item this evening. Uh, that is general fund budget revision number eight. Uh, there are several items on this uh, this evening. Uh, as you all remember, in our last council meeting, we voted to uh, do the pay increase for the last quarter of our fiscal year. Um, approximately $13,000 of this is uh, transfers to cover that uh, pay raise for the employees for that last quarter of the year. And the last item is um, a professional services line item for the pool. It is for some additional pool engineering costs in the amount of $11,897. Uh, this was a change order that was given to us uh, because when there were some items discovered at the uh, building of the pool, that they had to go in and re-engineer some things that were not anticipated. And so that is to cover uh, those unexpected pool engineering costs. So the net uh, transfer uh, is $24,186, and that is coming out of contingency. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of general fund budget revision number eight. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve general fund budget revision number eight. Is there any further discussion? I just have a question for the additional pool engineering costs. That's that's an approved change order then that we um, have agreed. Is that going to Omni or is that going to the general contractor for the project? Martin Aquatics. Okay. Um, and then I guess my follow-up question to that is how will we see the rest of the change orders associated with the pool project come through the budget? Are we going to have to have specific budget revisions for the additional change orders? If there are, but I mean, we're not, this money here was not allocated for that. So you know, it had to come out of contingencies to cover that. The other funds that are in there um, are covered already. So the other $330,000 of ch change orders are covered already? Yes. If not, then we would have been on a budget revision. Mrs. Oh, excuse me, our finance director is not here this evening, and so I will get that answer for you and tell you where that all transpired. But okay, okay. yeah, because that's I mean that's a bigger, much bigger chunk of money than just twelve thousand dollars for engineering costs, and I was unaware that we had already found that somewhere in our budget. So okay, all right. So I'll. Uh, 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 is there any further discussion? Yeah, I'm with um, Mr. Mancuso. I'm. I'm interested in how that 335 or plus thousand dollars is because we have not done a budget revision for that. So, um, then let me state this so that there's no misunderstandings. All right, our finance director is not here this evening. I will get you an answer to that very question. So, my interpretation of that, please forget that, and I will get you an answer. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, I'll call for the question. Would you poll counsel, please? Ms. Williams? Yes. Mr. Azinger? Yes. 
Mr. Rapp? Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby? Yes. Mr. Mancuso? Yes. All right. Uh, General Fund Budget Revision Number 8 passes unanimously. Um, the next item, and well, the next two items are resolutions uh, memorializing the appointment of Jim Leach to the City of Vienna Planning Commission and memorializing the appointment of Kim Williams to the City of Vienna Tree and Beautification Commission. Uh, Mr. Skogstad, uh, review at our ordinances, and would you please tell them the pertinence to this? Yeah. What a question I had was um, when some of these appointments had occurred, um, I reviewed all of our ordinances, and um, I don't mean this to be a criticism, but uh, the appointment process for some of these are not, they're not consistent with each other. For example, um, uh, Mrs. A Mrs. Uh, Elam was appointed to Vienna Rec. We had a resolution that went through and put her on the, what was it, the park board. Um, had the other two appointments, um, the Planning Commission and the Tree and Beautification Commission are appointed by the mayor and they don't require uh, council approval. Uh, but for example, Tree and Beautification, um, however, I think in order to make it clear, for example, Miss Williams' appointment to Tree and Beautification, um, so that it's clear that she's not just the liaison, because as I understand it, the intent was to place Miss Williams on the board, is I drafted a resolution that, that makes that makes it clear that she's the mayor's representative to the Tree and Beautification Board. Um, I think that the she was appointed, but we don't really have a, a good record for that. The same with the Planning Commission. Um, the Planning Commission ordinance um, allows for appointments by the mayor to the Planning Commission, um, but there's nothing that really memorializes that. So at some point in the future, I think I'm going to make if I'm directed or asked by council or the mayor uh, to make some changes to the way our ordinances work so that they're a little more internally consistent. But at this point, this is essentially to create a record for um, the tree and beautification and for the planning commission um, so that when somebody asks uh, the question is, when did this appointment occur? We have something to point to that says, well, this is what happened. Because that's what happened to me. As I was asked the question, I went looking for the information, and the information wasn't there. And so I, instead of spending um, two hours or ten hours going through minutes and trying to piece it together, I have something that I can clearly point to. And right now, this satisfies the requirements of both of those ordinances. So this is a little cleanup work. Uh, nothing changing on the appointments. It's a resolution memorializing the appointment of Jim Leach to the City of Vienna Planning Commission. Be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Vienna that Jim Leach, qualified by knowledge and experience in matters pertaining to the development of the city and to serve as the Vienna City Council representative for Vienna Municipal Code 133.03, .03, is hereby appointed to the Vienna Planning Commission per Municipal Code. His term of office with the Planning Commission is coextensive with his present term of office as council member. It is the intent of this resolution to memorialize Mr. Leach's previous appointment by the mayor to the Planning Commission. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the resolution memorializing the appointment of Jim Leach to the City of Vienna Planning Commission. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the resolution memorializing the appointment of Jim Leach. Is there any further discussion? I have a comment. So, and I appreciate your explanation, um, Mr. Skogstad, but this came about because um, I'm on the Tree and Beautification Commi Commission, and uh, I was appointed by the mayor in the, I think it was January 21, when everybody just came into office, and that, that resolution never came back for council to approve it. And, you know, that, that happened. But we ran into a problem because, you know, I always thought I was a voting member on Tree and Beautification, and um, there was some stuff that happened where they weren't following the Open Meetings Act, and um, I had an issue with that and was told I was just a liaison and not a voting member. And so I, it took two weeks or more to get clarification from the city attorney, which I'm happy that he provided it here this evening, and I'm glad this is going to get um, cleaned up this evening. But I, I think I'm going to withdraw my name from tree beautification. So um, when we get to that part, I know we're not on that now, but we can go on past it. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Then I'll call for the question. Would you poll counsel, please? Ms. Williams? No. Mr. Azinger? Yes. Mr. Rapp? Yes. I say yes. Mr. Bibby? Yes. 
Mr. Minkus, sir. Yes. All right. The resolution passes 5-1. So we'll move to the next item. Uh, this is memorializing the appointment of Kim Williams to the City of Vienna Tree and Beautification Commission. Um, I'm not going to read this. If you would like to make your statement now, then if you're withdrawing your name, we won't go through the process. Yeah, no, I, I think I made my statement. I'm just withdrawing my name this evening. All right. Thank you. Since you've withdrawn your name, then we will move on to item number eight. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not. Is she is she not voting or is she or is she, no, she, is she resigning to be from? Considered. Yeah. She doesn't want to be the liaison, the appointee to the tree and beautification anymore. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll move on. Are you good? Yes. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is a resolution to engage Mathers Forest Consulting LLC as a special project consultant for the city of Vienna. Have you got it? All right. As a resolution to engage Mathers Forest Consulting LLC as a special project consultant for the City of Vienna, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Vienna that it hereby engages Mathers Forest Consulting LLC as a special project consultant to assist to assist the city in the identification and possible development of special projects designed to benefit cultural, economic, and residential opportunities for the citizens of the City of Vienna, including assisting in the contribution, or I'm sorry, in the continuation of development plans for Spencer's Landing as described in the attached agreement. Further, the consultant will assist with evaluating current occupancy and use of commercial properties in the city of Vienna, focusing on unoccupied or dilapidated buildings from 9th Street to 34th Street, as also set out in the agreement. Finally, the consultant will accept a special projects assignment, will accept special projects assignments from the mayor's office, including promoting the city of Vienna as a relocation destination for families and small businesses. This provision is designed to supplement and complement the activities of the Wood County Economic Development Authority contract that is currently in effect. To the extent that the special project consulting agreement needs to be modified to include additional special projects, the mayor is authorized to execute any modification to the agreement to reflect the same. In no circumstances, the compensation received or dispensed under the contract to exceed $25,000. And just so we're clear, the resolution we passed our, uh, in a previous council meeting that um, made uh, Mr. Uh, Mathers an employ a part-time employee of the city would be superseded by this agreement. Tracy, can you hear me? Yes. Would you bring my my phone, please? Yes. All right. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution to engage Mathers Forest Consulting LLC as a special project consultant for the City of Vienna. Thank you. Okay. Did you did you ask for a motion? I did ask for a motion. So moved. <clears throat> I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the resolution to engage Mathers Forest Consulting LLC as a special project consultant for the city of Vienna. Um, I guess I'll open the discussion on this. Um, I know that there has been some discussion for at least six weeks, maybe two months. And we previously, as Mr. Scogg said, just um, related to that, we have hired Jack Mathers to work for the city of Vienna. We have spent a lot of time trying to figure out the project title, the, you know, all of the things, um, whether it's a 1099, whether it's an employee of the city. And after all of those discussions, um, the consultant um, avenue seems to be the best one to work not only for the city, but also to work for Jack Mathers. Um, there's been some questions raised about, uh, you know, the qualifications of Mr. Mathers. And so I would like to look at my notes here for just a minute. Um, there were some comments made earlier about the economic impact study. And the impact, uh, economic impact study is done. Uh, Senator Gowdy wanted to come this evening and present the project to us, but because of the length of the agenda and all of the things that were on it, I asked her if she would come on the 28th instead, and so she will be here on the 28th to present the economic impact study. 
uh, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion and um, she'll make several presentations and we'll have lots of questions to ask. So I didn't want the significance of that economic impact study to be uh, uh, lost in the agenda items for this evening. So it is done. Uh, we will get those results at the next council meeting, the next regular council meeting, and uh, that will be done. Um, this discussion that we continue to seem to have about Mr. Mather's uh, council or his uh, qualifications. And so I'm reading this right from the uh, organizational information. Um, it's a professional and scientific and technical services and a professional scientific and pro professional scientific and te technical services management, scientific and technical consulting services, the administrative general HR, marketing process, physical distribution, and logistics in addition to environmental issues. And so when you look at the LLC that Mathers Forest Consulting is, it gives a broad spectrum of things that Jack is qualified to do. But I think more than anything else, the, qualif the qualification that reached out to me was the fact that Jack Mathers is a man that can go into any crowd and make friends, discuss current topics, figure out how to benefit the city of Vienna, um, Jack, I'm not sure how old you are, but I know you spent most of your life in the city of Vienna. You know Vienna very well. Your family was from Vienna. And so when you talk about going out and doing various projects, uh, I was very involved with Paul Thornton on the Brownsville projects. It takes an incredible amount of work that you cannot quit on in order to see that thing through. And so, yes, we got a grant from the EPA for the Brownsville cleanup of Johns Manville. That was a successful program for us. Um, there is so much legwork that needs to be done. And fortunately for me, Jack has the personality that he can adapt himself to what other crowd he's in. If it's the forestry guys and we get on our needs and we put mulch in around the new trees like we will do on Arbor Day, Jack's the first one down. If it's in a crowd where he has to discuss, you know, funding for things and what have you, I, you know, I proudly took him to the Wood County Development Authority meeting uh, last month, and he knew almost everyone in the room. And those are the kind of personal relationships that you have to capitalize on in order to make these projects go. I had a letter with me today that I received this week from Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, officially signifying that the city of Vienna has received our $1 million earmark for the expansion of our sewer system to the city of Parkersburg. I am uh, very proud of this letter because we worked really hard to get this. A million dollars won't get you very much nowadays, but a million dollars will get our sewer line upgraded to Parkersburg about halfway. And so, you know, this, this, result of this right here is a million dollars. It's a million dollars right here, okay? And so the other projects that we have that we're working on currently in the city of Vienna are all of the bridge improvements, 12th Street, 17th Street, 18th Street, 27th Street. All of those have been included in the governor's plan. They're working on 17th Street now. We've asked that the 12th Street project be a bridge renovation instead of, or I mean a bridge replacement instead of the bridge renovation. Hopefully they'll approve that for us. But all of those bridges have been approved. Um, they are at the top of the list on the Department of Highways schedule of things to be done. And so we've got Spencer's Landing. Um, I know that Tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow, the RFQ will be advertised for an engineering firm to come in for the development of Spencer's Landing. <laughs> We're going to entertain um, all of the engineering companies to come in and make proposals and see who we can select to be the uh, engineering firm uh, that council would eventually approve 
for the development of Spencer's Landing and the um, uh, new projects that we have on going on down there. Um, I've had interest from some of the bigger engineering firms, uh, so I'm sure that we'll have lots of people that will be interested in looking at that program for us. And so this right here, the resolution that we have before us this evening, um, it doesn't change a lot of things. It simply cleans up the paperwork on how Jack's job, his role with the city will be. Um, and so I, I would encourage us to pass this resolution. For the discussion, please. Yeah. Um, I would just like to say that I think there's a lot of new information in this agreement. Um, and I think we should table this item. We've had four days to review and consider this. Um, and as before, with the Wood County Development Authority, um, when uh, Kim and myself presented that, it was tabled because we didn't have enough time to review it as council members. Um, I feel that it is only appropriate to do the same here. Um, the Wood County Development Authority proposal was three or four pages. This agreement is almost seven pages long with a lot of legal jargon that I'm sure not all of us are used to reading and interpreting. So I move to table this tonight. Second. So moved and seconded that we table the resolution to engage Mathers Forest Consulting, LLC. Would you please poll counsel? Um, Ms. Williams. Yes. Mr. Easinger. No. Um, Mr. Rapp. No. I say no. Mr. Bibby. No. Mr. Mancuso. Yes. All right. So the uh, motion, motion to table fails. Um, I'll open the floor back up for discussion. Okay. Um, well, I was hoping to table this because I have a lot of questions, uh, but if you'll bear with me, I'd like to kind of go through this, uh, this agreement that uh, is before us this evening. Um, May I ask one question, Chris? Yeah. Mr. Scott said you did prepare this agreement. I, I have that agreement. Okay, then please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my first comment and question is, is it appropriate for the city to hire a forest consulting organization to facilitate cultural, economic, and residential opportunities in the city of Vienna? And how can we, as a council, justify hiring a forest consultant for these purposes? Is that a question for me? No, I, that's just a general question. Okay. Preferably, I guess, the mayor, since he sponsored it. Can you please justify that for me? I think that... Mr. Mathers has the best interest of the city in everything that he does. And because he has ran the Freedom Festival for two years and has gotten out and got a feel for um, what the city of Vienna likes and, you know, would like to see, um, you know, the cultural side of it. I mean, I don't, I don't see that that's a, an issue. All right. We're open for anything that the city, the citizens of the city of Vienna would like to see, whether it's recreation sports or whether it's concerts or um, any of those things. And so um, I don't believe there's any limitations on the cultural development of the city. You know, uh, earlier in the in the discussions this evening, there were comments made about the Central Business District. Mm -hmm. You know, the Central Business District of Vienna is not like the Central Business District of Parkersburg or Marietta. When you look at the Central Business District of Vienna, it's what, seven or eight buildings. You know, when you get into the commercial zone, you know, down towards the mall and all the restaurants and all the development that's down there, that's a totally different animal. Uh, you talk about, um, you know, downtown development, Main Street programs and all those. The the two blocks of the old Vitrolite building and, and the other ones that are there, those are the old Vienna that have been here for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And yes, if there were opportunities to refurbish them, to save them, to present them in a new light, that would be great. So you're, you, you haven't really answered my question because I've, I've asked how you can justify hiring a forest consultant to provide the services that are needed to develop this downtown business district. Can I just have one second? And uh, in, uh, Mr. Leach has landed his plane and he is very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
the end. Well, I mean, if you want to look at my text messages, I was just sitting here. Hey, I know. Jim, can you hear me? The rest of us are here now. Right. So is he going to call in? I, I don't know what he's doing. Yeah. All I know is I got a text that said, I'm off the plane. Can you get my call? Okay. So there you go. I told him my phone's not working all that well. Where is he at? Well, he's apparently waiting. Ground transportation is what the text said. Where? I don't know. Hey, Jim. Do you, yeah, yeah. Do you have the ability to call back in on the uh, main line here so we can put you on the uh, phone on council table? Yeah, I just didn't have that work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're good. 304-865-0358. Yeah, All right. And by the way, I can get texts on my laptop. It's not a... <laughs> Roger, are you still with us? I am. Great. So I'm going to try to answer Jim. Here we go. Jim, are you there? I am in kind of a noisy spot in the airport, but I can hear you. All right, fine. So we're having discussion. Mr. Mancuso has the floor. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity if you so choose here in just a moment. Chris. Yeah, so again, I, I'm asking for clarification on how the city can justify hiring a forest consultant to manage economic development when it concerns a historic downtown district. Well, there are many more things besides the downtown district. And as I told you in my opening remarks. I understand, but I'm asking a specific question about the downtown district and how we are justifying hiring a forest consultant to provide economic development services for that downtown district. Okay, so I will answer you specifically. Thank you. All right. Um, you're using such a narrow scope because of the forestry tag that's in Jack's business title. As I spoke to you in my remarks earlier, I have a tremendous amount of faith in Jack because of the ability to do things and get things done that I have seen over the past years. And so when you say, how can that happen? If I, if he tells me he can get a job done, I'm pretty confident it'll get done. All right. So you, yeah, I, that's where my concern is here, mayor, because you're asking us to take your word for it, that Mathers Forest Consulting LLC is the company that is qualified to handle economic residential and cultural development. And that makes me very uncomfortable. Then that is your right to vote no. Okay. Um, Can I interject here, Mayor, too? No, I still have the floor. I'm sorry. Excuse I, I'm me. Sitting. I'll run this meeting, Chris. Jim, I will get to you in a minute. Mr. Mancuso okay. would like to finish. So you just mentioned earlier the agreement with uh, WVUP between the city and WVUP extension office for the economic impact studies complete. Yet that is one of the specific items listed under services provided. Um, similarly, Spencer's Landing, that is something that, as everyone well knows, I have been pushing for for a long time. I think everyone on council agrees that we have been hoping for development there for a long time. Council has already appropriated money for an architecture firm, a landscape architecture firm that specializes in brownfield development. We have allocated $32,000 to hire them, and I have put forth a resolution to do so. The name is Merritt Chase. They're out of Pittsburgh. Um, we have put, I have put that forth before, and Councilman Leach has asked to table that. And to what reason, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but I think handling Spencer's Landing in that way uh, is perfectly acceptable. And I would be happy to bring that resolution back to council at the next meeting so that we can move forward with that. Um, if we want to talk about slapping in the face, um, which we have before in council, uh, it is very clear of my passion for Spencer's Landing and seeing the development there. So to hear for the first time tonight that there's going to be an RFQ put out tomorrow after I have written RFQs and handed them to the mayor and emailed several versions of that to him. Um, 
that mayor is a slap in the face. And I don't understand why we have to have a special consultant to handle that project when I have been volunteering my time throughout the last two and a half years, even before I was on council, to help facilitate the development of that project. Do you have time for an answer? Are you continuing? Sure, I'll have time for an answer, yeah. Okay, fine. Chris, the problem that I have with this whole thing is there doesn't seem to be any pathway that satisfies you and some other members of council because, you know, we've talked about this and it's like, well, you're doing it the right way. All right, so fine. We go out for the RFQ. That is as open as you can get it. Any engineering firm that wants to apply for that job can apply. They will be interviewed by a panel of people, and then they'll narrow it down and pick someone that can do exactly what you've tried to get done. And now that we've went down that road, you're not happy. I don't know what it takes to do this because, you know, we had that discussion at length about the people that you recommended. And, yes. And so... Now it was brought up that we didn't do it fairly. So now we're going back and saying, okay, it's open for anyone, any engineering firm that wants to bid on it, and you don't like it. I, how do you want me no, to No, I'm not it? saying I don't like that. I, I'm saying it was a, you didn't even mention to me that we were going down that road, and I had specifically agreed to table the resolution to hire Merritt Chase because of this economic impact study that was supposed to be presented this evening. And I understood that that could have implications. And so I agreed that we could table that resolution. And now we're moving forward with an RFQ. And I, I mean, for me to hear that for the first time this evening, yeah, I'm a little bit upset about that. Um, and, and so, again, you know, when we're talking about this agreement that's before us this evening and the services provided, um, I feel like those things are, are, are already well underway, and we don't have to hire someone specifically to do that. My other concern is under services provided um, A2, downtown Vienna, um, and that's something we've kind of already discussed. We have hired the Wood County Development Authority and paid them $75,000 to work for us for a year. They are an economic development authority who this is their main goal is to help develop our downtown area. I think it was even explicitly stated in our agreement with them. So I don't know why we have to go out to a third party or a fourth party, if you will, because we already have a third party consultant to help provide those services. It makes no sense. Item number three, additional projects. To the extent reasonable within the scope of this agreement, accept special project assignments from the mayor's office. First of all, that is direct assignments from the mayor's office without approval of any, anyone on council. And it also goes in direct conflict with items that are later on in this agreement that say that this position won't have any direct authority from the mayor or from the city, and they'll act independently. So there's so many things in this agreement that I would be happy to, to work with, and that's why I asked to table it, because I feel like we really need to like carefully look at this and make sure that it is, it is buttoned up and correct, and we're not going to catch ourselves in a 1099 versus W-2 conflict and whether or not this person should actually be an employee of the city, and it's not. Uh, Chris, if I could just, with the last thing you said, um, the, those two provisions, I mean, I, I think I understand why you're saying that, but those uh, those two provisions aren't actually in conflict with each other. One of the stakes is between a 1099 and a W-2 employee, a 1099 being an independent contractor and a W-2 being an employee, is that Essentially, it's like this: if I'm a if I'm a subcontractor or a contractor, 1099 employee, um, somebody gives me an assignment, and they say, "Here's the assignment. Do this assignment." And however you do it is however you do it. Mm -hmm. With a W-2 employee, you say, "Here's the assignment. You're going to do the assignment between 8:30 and 4:30 Monday through Friday at the city building, and these this is the equipment you're going to use, and you know, and lays out a much more controlled, um, a much more controlled, I guess." oversight of the work. I don't think those two things are 
in this agreement or in this proposal are are in are conflicting with each other. At least in at least in my reading of it, I, I can understand why you're saying that, mm -hmm. but it, when you read it in the entire context, under this agreement, uh, the mayor gives this person an assignment and says, "Okay, I need you to do X." Right? The person goes and does X. There's not that direct oversight and control, and you have to have that uh, to satisfy the uh, wage and labor. Uh, EEOC, uh, division, uh, what else is the IRS, um, and the West Virginia Code. There's a Code of State, Codified State Rules has some specific things in it that list out the distinction between a W-2 or a contractor and an employee. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's also, it's in West Virginia statute as well. But I mean, I, and I didn't mean to interrupt, I just wanted to make sure Sure, that was a that was more of a lawyer question. Yeah, yeah. And I want to make sure I don't think those two pr provisions are um, conflict with each other, at okay. least in the context of the overall document. Okay. Are you done, Chris? <laughs> no. Right. Um, Please continue then. So, item number three in this agreement is labeled as performance. The parties agree to do everything necessary to ensure that the terms of this agreement take effect. I don't understand what that means. Um, that's the whole reason we have an agreement is to make sure these things happen. So are we, are we speaking about performances in he's going to come and provide quarterly updates, monthly updates? What are, what are we describing in item number three under performance there? Um, whenever there's something to report, then yes, he will come and, and tell what progress has been made. Um, you know, there are certain things that go on that take a lengthy period of time and other ones happen fairly quickly. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, but yes, we will be given. Okay. Um, I guess I just don't understand because we don't really have anything to base the performance of this consultant off of. So how do we know if this is successful or if we're just throwing $25,000 away? I mean, I would certainly hope not. And I understand that Mr. Mathers cares a lot about the city of Vienna, but is there any way for us to say, hey, look, he has like provided X number of new businesses developed in the downtown district, or he has worked to, you know, Spencer's Landing has a plan now, and we have grant money for it, and, you know, he, we have X number of projects completed in this year of time, or are we just hoping that things kind of work out and his performance is just based on trusting that he's a good guy. I can tell you that we've never been busier than we are right now at this point. There are so many projects that are moving in every direction that it's incredible. And so, so if, they all, if they all come forward, then we will present them to the public and council. But uh, there's a certain amount of confidentiality that can't not be exposed at this time. So, okay, I understand that. There's certain projects that we can't speak about. But what projects can we speak about besides Spencer's Landing, which, as I've said, I have been more than forthright and willing to help with, the economic impact study, which is already complete, and economic development, which the economic development authority, um, I feel, should be overseeing. And I told you that there are certain confidential, and you know them, that we cannot speak about, but they are big projects and, and they are things that we are working on. Are there any other projects then? It continues. My goodness gracious. I mean, oh well, I, I'm not going to go into that any farther because I'm not going to break a, a confidentiality agreement. So uh, you're well aware of all the ones that are moving on. And so uh, it's a very long list. I know of three and I would say that none of them would require a special consultant to handle or manage that I am fairly confident in without disclosing anything um, so unless there are other projects that I'm unaware of then I again I don't see you know the need to hire a special consultant at this time Chris we we already hired him okay that past council that's a done deal. Now, the language that's in this clarifies some things. If if you don't agree with the language or, or something, then you have the, and it's your right to vote no. You don't have to approve this. Okay. 
I guess I just have some other questions about this agreement, and then I will probably have some amendments to make as after I get some questions answered. Um, why is item number four listed? Why do we have to discuss currency and except as otherwise provided in this agreement, all amounts are U.S. dollars? It's just a that's just a general term that we put in there that we're put in these agreements. Um, I don't think you, I mean, it just, it, it says what it says. I mean, why does it have to be there? I suppose it doesn't. I mean, we're not going to play them in Bitcoin or anything. But, um, but, I mean, I suppose we could have an agreement where we did agree to pay in Bitcoin, in which case you would change that. It's, it's not one that I'd get hung up on, but it's there. But I understand your question, why is something so obvious in there? Sometimes you have to write the obvious in there, right? I know, I, it, it's just... These are some of the things that I feel like could be cleaned up or removed and taken out that just seem kind of silly to me. Um, I do have a question about reimbursement. I have a question about the reimbursement of expenses. Are those are we anticipating travel expenses associated with this? Do we have anticipated expenses? Um, I know with several agreements that we have and have had previously, we have a limit on those reimbursable expenses of up to 1500 or $2,000, but there's no limit here. So can we get kind of a reasonable estimate of what we think those are going to be? It depends on where we have to send him to go and for how long. If there's a conference at Stonewall Jackson, it might be you know, a three-day conference or something. It could be the Brownsfield Conference in Morgantown. Um, and, you know, it just depends. All right. But so you have, to, you have to allow a certain amount of money in there if he has to go to a meeting or a conference. Um, you're speaking of educational conferences that I feel like if someone was a professional and ready to handle these things, wouldn't necessarily have to attend. So are we paying for education for this consultant? It brings back the same thing of networking, Chris. It's like last night at the dinner that I spoke about. The people that I sat with, one was the finance chairman of the House of Delegates. The other one was the one that was very high up in the tourism department. <laughs> Those are the kind of things that you go to these meetings to meet people so that when you call them on the phone, you can say, oh, Delegate Skogstad, I saw you at, at the North Bend State Park thing. And it's like it rings a bell and it obviously gives you a step forward. All right. I mean. That's part of the, the getting your name out there and getting people to realize who you are. Sure. I mean, I, I guess it's kind of confusing to me because, again, we agreed with the Wood County Development Authority to pay them a flat rate of $75,000. And we're not giving them any reimbursable expenses for any of the travel that they do all over the state um, as far as representing the city of Vienna down in Charleston or any of those things. So I don't know that. You know, with especially without any kind of not to exceed limit in here, it makes me very uncomfortable because one of those conferences could be five thousand dollars with hotel and travel and program fees and all of that, and that's not listed in here. And so, where's that money going to come from? And how much are we willing to invest in this consultant for some kind of rate of return? Um, I guess n number seven kind of concerns me a little bit. It talks about confidentiality, and there's some things that I understand projects that have to remain confidential. Um, but it it talks in a very businesslike way, um, including but not limited to accounting records, business processes, and client records that's generally not known to the industry of the client and where the release of that information could be expected to harm the client. Um, we're a city. Uh, pretty much everything we do can be FOIA'd and looked at, except for some very specific items. And I'm not sure how that plays with this consultant in some of the projects. I don't understand why someone, this consultant would need to be looking at the city's accounting records or business processes um, 
those things are all pretty public for um, a city standpoint, correct? Yeah, yes, there are instances where there are things that are that the city is working on that have to remain confidential until sure. they're complete. And I think it's the intent of this that to tell the contract worker that if these things are to remain confidential, uh, this is important enough that it remains confidential. Well, I know some of the language is brought in there, but or it covers a lot of different things. Um, and part of that is, you know, this was, this is part of it. Well, part of that is you just try and cover your bases whenever you deal with this stuff. You can't think of every situation or scenario, but basically it gives it, it gives the, the city would have recourse um, dealing with the individual if he were to disclose information, you know, that at the time um, has to remain confidential. And you're right, for the most part, at some point, um, I can't think of but a few instances where information does remain um, not exempt from disclosure right. or Freedom of Information Act and so forth. But during the course of a, of a project, um, there are instances where things could remain confidential. And again, this just requires the contract that it, the contractee to adhere to that confidentiality. I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but there, um, in the end, you end up being right. But during the process, you still need to have some recourse. Uh, but anyway, okay, that's the lawyer answer. Um, number eight: ownership of intellectual property. I again, I don't. This makes no sense to me as far as this, from a city standpoint. Um, are we expecting this consultant to develop? intellectual property that they're going to then hand back to the city? What kind of intellectual property are we expecting this consultant to perform or develop? I can't answer the first part of that question, but I can answer the, uh, the general nature of why you would have an intellectual property provision in there. Um, for example, if part of one of the projects was that the contracted employee or the contractee um, was to develop a logo, you know, as part of the project. And, um, and then uh, you don't have an explicit provision in there that says that the logo is the property of the city. Copyright is different. Uh, if, for example, if the contract if the contract the contract E developed something, mm -hmm. logo, whatever, on behalf of the city, there's always a question of the ownership of that intellectual property. Uh, copyright, when you affix it to a medium, becomes the property of the person who created whatever the content is. Actually, any yes, affixed it to a medium is 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 the um, actually the test, whether it's video, audio, paper, or any other type of medium that you can think of. Um, what makes it uh, actionable for copyrighted materials is if it is registered with the copyright office. But I'm not going to diverge too much from this to go into election on intellectual and copyright law. So what I'm saying is if for whatever whatever odd circumstance that the contractee were to generate something that could be associated with the city and then if there's not this ownership provision or something that's clear in it, contractee decides to create a city of Vienna logo that becomes associated with the city, city doesn't own the property, the contractee came up with it and starts putting it on t-shirts or as I saw happen in a television show, um, and when I say happen in a television show, I'm talking about not a fictional show. Um, a group contracted with a local law enforcement office, and then the local law enforcement office didn't have a provision in this, and then proceeded to make toys with that law enforcement office's um, badging and so forth on it. And they, the police officers, well, they're quite thrilled that they're, they could now buy cars with their badges on it. We're not particularly thrilled that maybe they weren't receiving remuneration. Do I think that's likely to happen here? No, but it answers that question. Now, as for the first part of your question, that's not a lawyer question. That's something else. Yeah, so that's, I guess, a question for Mayor App or Councilman Leach. Do, are we expecting this consultant to develop things, items that fall under intellectual property that we need to have this? Jim, are you still there? I have my phone on mute. That's fine. No, you know, Chris, a lot of these things that you're talking about are general provisions that are uh, what in a legal term, and I'm sure you're familiar because it's the same thing in your business when you're developing plans, they're boilerplate, okay? They cover um, various provisions that may or may not come up, and, and Chris and, uh, and Russ's example of developing a logo, even taking a photograph, 
you know, um, you know, can be subject to that. But, you know, so the confidentiality provision, no, it's not going to take second to FOIA, but what that makes clear is it will be the city administration, the city attorney, that will determine uh, at what point information is not confidential, not the contractor. Uh, likewise, with intellectual property, anything that's developed, and no, I don't know, you know, I don't expect him, you know, to develop a, uh, you know, all of a sudden, a, you know, a, a special concoction drink called the City of Vienna cocktail, who knows. But, uh, you know, some of these things are just, and it even the U.S. currency provision, I couldn't hear everything you were saying. But the things that I've read, there's, you know, uh, I mean, Bitcoin is a, <laughs> is a thing now, and it, and it is a, a recognized currency. And so that's why these provisions are landing in as, as standard clauses in these contracts. Um, so anyway, so I, I don't know that I've heard your exact question for me. The intellectual property, uh, I think, is more toward just anything that's produced in the service of the city um, belongs to the city. So that kind of follows with my question for item number nine, listed as return of property. Upon the expiration of this agreement, the consultant will return the client any property documentation records or information that is the client's property. Um, does this include physical property? Like, why, I, I'm very uncomfortable with this because does this mean that Mathers Forestry Consulting could potentially temporarily use city property for who knows what? And then for how long, for a year, and then, you know, that's really concerning to me that someone outside of the city who's an, not an elected official could then basically have access to city property without anything other than this agreement, correct? You're saying... No, your question is, can a person who is operating under the terms of this equipment have access to any city property? Or, or have take temporary ownership of property, yeah. No. Um, if the city, for whatever reason, would provide some uh, person, oh, I don't know, um, and, I, and I try to use examples because examples are a little easier for people to get a hold of. Um, and this is a laptop, all right? Mr. Mather says, I, I need to use a laptop in order to do this. Um, and the city says, we have an extra one. Will he use this for the purposes of completing this project, and you have to return it? He'd be under the same provisions or the same restrictions as anybody else, but he can't use it for personal use. He can't. I mean, you're not supposed to use your iPads and what have you for personal use. It all has to be city business. Um, but uh, and he would have to return it, and it makes it clear that anything that any property that belongs to the city. But I don't think it vests in him a right. He can't say, "Well, okay, well tomorrow I need to use council or." Six o'clock on Thursday, two weeks from now, I need to use council chambers, so you guys need to get out. I don't think it does that. But I think it just, and, and, okay. I, and I think it puts them under the same restrictions that it would for anybody that um, is spending tax dollars, which is you have to abide by the, uh, you have to abide by the same ethics rules that everybody else does. You can't use public property for private gain. Um, now, so, and, you know, it gives us, again, a recourse. We, you, you, we let you use this laptop uh, or whatever uh, for, to complete this project. You didn't give it back. That's a violation of this agreement. So we're done. Well, uh, you know. I think I understand what you're saying, but and that makes sense for an employee of the city or an elected official, but I don't know how it applies to a consultant because then in item number 13 under equipment, it says it, right. that they consulting at their own expense will provide software materials and any other supplies necessary. Well, I understand what you're saying there. You're supposed to bring your own stuff. I can imagine that there will be times. And I want you all to understand I'm not defending um, any of this except for to say whether or not I believe that the agreement is legal and try to explain to you. As I've said before, and um, it's not my job to uh, insert my wisdom for any of council's actions. It's only whether or not I think that they comply with the law. All right, so the number 13 says you got to bring your own equipment. If you want to play ball, you got to bring your own ball and glove, okay? Mm -hmm. Number number um, nine says if you have anything that belongs to the city, it's got to come back to the city. Now, I can't foresee every scenario, but that's generally what it covers. Look, if you're going to do the work, you have to bring your own tools. And if you uh, need to use something that belongs to the city, then you need to bring it back, right? I can give you a perfect example that may clear your mind up. Um, 
recently we held an event at the Vienna Public Library, which we called Rediscover Vienna. Mm -hmm. We got an incredible amount of pictures of old Vienna. So the, if a laptop was needed to put that PowerPoint on for that display, of which Jack was there because of the book Discovering Vienna, okay? That's the issue that's there is if it's in the course of promoting something, which in my opinion was a cultural event because we brought all of the artifacts out, then that was a legitimate use of a laptop for that PowerPoint, okay? It, you know, and, and I know you're aware of this, yeah. but there are some systems that don't work well with Mac and some that don't work well. And so you kind of have to adapt yourself to whatever's available. I'm not a Mac person. I can't do that. But having said that, that's the kind of issue that could conceivably come up. Okay. Um, numbers, items 11 and 12 are also a big cause of concern for me. Um, the right of substitution, you know, I can understand that in some circumstances, uh, but engaging a third party subcontractor to perform some or all of the consultants obligations under this agreement, and that we as the client would then pay the compensation to the consultant. So that, based on my understanding, that means that if Forest, Mathers Forest Consulting LLC is given a project that's directed by the mayor's office, um, and he feels that he is incapable of doing that, can go out to a third party, say an architectural design firm, and hire them as a subcontractor for $250,000 then we as a client would be responsible for reimbursing that? No. That's what, it, that's what it says. No. It allows for, if there's some kind of a specific test that you need to have done, if you could go get Skogstad's engineering firm to do this, it would have to be brought back for us to approve the expenditure for additional testing that Mr. Skogstad's firm could do. It doesn't say that anywhere in this. It says... You can only do the things that you have money for. It says if the consultant hires a subcontractor, the consultant will pay the subcontractor for its services and the client, the city, will pay the compensation to the consultant. It doesn't say anything about coming back to council for approval for those things anywhere. Is that not a concern for the city? That he could hire a subcontractor for any number of reasons, for any number of projects with an unlimited scope in that project. In that project, who knows? I mean, if you're talking about Spencer's Landing, realistically, that's probably a 10 to $15 million project. And so to hire someone to do that could be upwards of $500,000. And based on this agreement, Mathers Forest Consulting LLC could hire that subcontractor to design Spencer's Landing without approval of council or anyone, and we would have to pay that subconsultant. Is that correct? I don't think that that is entirely correct. However... And the fact that you've brought that point up, I think, is clear that, that the language could be changed to put something in there that says you're not to do it, you know, you're limited to your own to a cap of X dollars, or you're not to do it at all. Um, I certainly think you could modify the agreement to do that. But no, I, I don't, generally speaking, I, don't, I think that's outside of the scope of this agreement. This isn't to allow, um, I don't think it's... I don't think that this agreement would allow you to circumvent either Vienna purchasing or the Vienna purchasing ordinances, state code, or anything else. Um, but that said, if you're bringing the issue up and it's not clear enough to you, yeah. then it certainly could be modified. All this entire agreement could be right. modified. Right, and that's why I had asked to table it because I wanted to have the time to modify it and review it a little closely because these are some big question marks for me. Um, because item number twelve says autonomy, right? It, 
except as otherwise provided in this agreement, the consultant will have complete control over working times, methods, decision making regarding the provision of the services per the agreement. Well, the consultant will work autonomously and not at the direction of the client, which goes in direct conflict with the previous items. I, I don't think it goes in direct conflict with the previous items. And I think that um, the reason that that has to be in there that way is... Uh, West so that Virginia, it's a 1099, correct? West, right. West Virginia right. Code of State Rules 110.560, um, West Virginia Code uh, 21.5L4. There's specific statutory language now that West Virginia adopted. And part of that was to clarify the state's own uh, statutes with respect to workers' comp, unemployment compensation, the Human, right, Human Rights Act, and wage and payment collection in order to make the distinction between an employee and a 1099 contractor or a, a independent contractor. You have to have specific things in writing now um, so that it's very clear to all of the parties that the person is not an employee. Um, and that's, so, that's one of the things is they have to have autonomy over their over. Yeah. Their that, that's one of the things that kind of really bothers me about this is we're kind of bending over backwards and jumping through a lot of hoops to make this a 1099 consultant position when it's pretty clearly a position that the city should probably just create. If we want to create a project coordinator position in the city, let's do that because then we won't have to worry about subcontractors and those items outside of the city's purview from a consultant. Uh, I mean, that's a huge concern for me. And we can trust Mr. Mathers a lot, but it, it concerns me that there's like no limit under item 11 that he could hire any subcontractor he needs to complete the project. And then the city would be on the hook for paying for that subcontract. Yeah, I think that's outside of the, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I think that's outside of the, outside of the scope of the agreement. Um, that said, that paragraph, the, that specific provision could be easily modified to put a cap on it. And I, as far as the other part, I, I don't have a, that, that's not a rest question. Right. <laughs> um, so the item number 17, modification of agreement, any amendment or modification of this agreement or additional obligation assumed by either party will only be binding of evidence in writing so who is in control of the modification of this agreement? Is it the mayor it or is it council? Be, it would ultimately be the mayor. So he could, the mayor could extend this agreement for another 15 years no. at $25,000 a year. No, in the context of the agreement, I understand what you're saying, but in the context of the agreement, that is, that provision is for, so you have, say you have three, three projects and then a fourth project comes along and then we agree as part of that, you uh, you have to do this fourth project, and it's to protect both the city and the and the contractor or the contractee. So, so the mayor could not then extend this out for another year no. without council no, approval. No, the, the, the agreement. This agreement has a has an end greet now. It's got a blank space in there now because we didn't have. A, I don't have a date of execution, but the agreement remains in full force and effect until a date that would be specified. In this case, it ends in 2025, subject to the earlier termination set out in the agreement. If you want to terminate it, and that's in paragraph two under the terms of the agreement. Yeah. So, I guess that that again doesn't really make sense why we have this modification of an agreement because under the services provided, it's basically. Any any special project assignments from the mayor's office? Is, yeah, that's how it's worded. Essentially, yes. So if you have four projects, three projects that are already contemplated by the agreement, and the agreement's broad enough that it says, "Well, we, I need I need you to work on this fourth project as well." You reduce it to writing, and you both work on it. It doesn't change compensation. It doesn't change um, you know any other part of the agreement. It just says. We both understand that you're also going to work on this fourth project or this fifth project. Okay. The benefits of these agreements, the way that they're constructed is for the, the person who's being contracted is that, um, you know, there may be a month where they don't have a lot of work, but then they run the risk of the next month where they may have a lot of work. That's how it, it, it used yeah. to be for me. I actually was, uh, before the IRS decided that I wasn't. I used to be um, an independent contractor for the city, but because the city uh, controlled when and where and the times that I did my work, 
for IRS purposes, I became uh, uh, more or less a part-time employee. Um, but that's what would happen for me as I would come up to the city, and this was 10, 15 years ago, and I would have a few weeks where I didn't have a project. And then I would have uh, two weeks where I had 15 projects. And I took the check, so I needed to get the work done. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I had agreed to. And that's I'm going to stop you for a second. Okay. Mike, would you turn the heat down? I think some of those ladies are going into meltdown over there. Right. They have to listen to me talk. So. Oh, um, item number 18, time is of the essence. I generally understand that. I'm not sure that there is an explicit project that's listed above that is under a certain time constraint. Does this just mean that should a project come up that say, hey, June 5th, it has to be done? Like, that's responsible. For I think that's a reasonable interpretation okay. of it. Okay. Um, That's so number nineteen. I'm I'm a little confused about how that relates, um, in relation to item number eleven. Those kind of seem like they're saying the same thing, just a little now, differently. Now, the right of substitution is something else. Um, a right of substitution is whenever it allows the contractor to come in and say, um, "I'm going to contract out with this third party or whatever." to do some work as you've, as you've described it. Item number 19, the assignment says, um, if you buy a business, and I, I don't know that Mr. Bathurst's was business would be the type that, that uh, you would sell to, I don't know, Giant Forest Company X, uh, but let's pretend that it is. Um, Giant Forest Company X and buying it would have to buy it subject to the properties to the, any contracts or agreements that he has in place. That's fairly common. If I buy a okay. rental property, um, then I take it knowing that I have to honor whatever leases and what have you are there. This is the same general idea. Um, but um, if, in this instance, it says the consultant will only voluntarily or by operational law sign or otherwise transfer its obligations under this agreement, agreement with the client's prior written consent. In this case, the contractor would have to get the city's permission to, if he were to sell his business and it would be obligated by this agreement, then uh, then uh, he would have to have the city's permission to do it. That, and that's a fairly routine uh, provision in most of these types of contracts. Okay. Um, I guess my last comment, I, I would like to definitely make some amendments on this, but I'm not sure why item number 23 is listed. I, this seems very boilerplate to me, but... Um, and that, that's a lawyerism. Yeah. The gender, uh, what happens is sometimes when you write a contract, you'll write he, you'll write she. And what all that, all that does is so that when the two lawyers are arguing over the contract, well, you said he and it's a she. So this doesn't apply to my client because he's a he. It just says that all of this means one person or one entity. It's all one and the same. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I would like to make some amendments. Um, but I'll give my time up for now if anyone else has any other have comments before I make those. So, Mr. Leach, are you still with us? Yeah. So I'm going to allow you to speak next because if you get caught in the airport, then we will lose you. So. Okay. Um, so out of everything that I understood Chris to say, let's go to 11, right of substitution, uh, 11C. All right. I don't take that at all to mean that um, Mathers Forest LLC can go outside of the compensation agreement. If he decides, for example, that he wanted to bring Centigalli because, uh, in and say, I, I need to talk to you about this and you're going to charge me, you know, $100 for this meeting, that he would be obligated to pay her because he retained her, but that has to come out of his 25000 So the only amendment or the only thing that I would make clear here is in the way I read this language is that, you know, he's agreed and he gets paid by the city. So he's responsible to pay that subcontractor because he made the agreement and that we will pay the compensation, the consultant in terms of his. So I don't believe 
that this agreement allows him to uh, engage in any additional expense other than the twenty five thousand. Uh, without, for example, that could be a you know a modification. If it was substantial enough, I'm sure that uh, you know that the mayor would bring it. And then that also goes back to expenses. Those have to be approved. So with Chris's example of you know there could be a five thousand dollar seminar. Well, the uh, you know I think that that would have to be approved by the city before he could incur that expense. Um, and I think the rest is going to you know most a lot of that would be de minimis, but mainly on that right of substitution. I don't read that language. And Russ, if you know, uh, so I would move to amend it in, in any form that Russ would suggest to make clear that that the purpose of that right is, is that he has the ability to get somebody involved to get some of their expertise if it's something he wants to know about. And he needs to pay for it, but that's his decision, and that comes out of his money. Um, and so, but aside from that, uh, you know, the uh, you know, I think everything else, Russ, I agree with what Russ has explained as to as to how these function and operate. You can't you can't control every contingency, and if, and then um, and if this is my, I'm going to speak to unless you tell me not to, Mayor. Generally, uh, about this agreement. I agree, number one, that, that Jack Mathers has already been retained as a consultant by the city. Number two, a 1099 agreement is the preference of our finance director. It's my preference. It's the pre preference of Mr. Mathers. It's the best way to go about this in the way that we want him to function. Number three, I did talk Monday um, with Lindsay Pearsall from the Economic Development, and, and I reviewed this agreement with her, the, not every jot and tittle, you know, but the, the primary provisions of his responsibilities, she, she agreed and she made the comment to me that was similar to what the mayor said. She said, no, I, uh, I was on, for example, she said, and I don't think she's going to object to me quoting her. I was on the Friends of Vienna board for a period of time. And Jack Mathers would come and say he was going to do this. And I was like, yeah, right. And then he would go do it. And so he has made a believer of me and I view this agreement in the in the way that this will work together is that Lindsay is working on some macro projects for us. She's looking at the big picture, the big numbers, uh, the big swings, okay? And Jack is more in the trenches, like, you know, some of these things we can do downtown. I you know, I listen I did go back as we were doing this and when I got on the Wi Fi I was able to watch most of the live stream of the meeting up to when I was able to get on the call. So I heard the public comments and so forth. Um, but that, uh, you know, that, that the details that Jack can attend to are going to complement what the, the Economic Development Authority is working to achieve. And, you know, and with respect to Spencer's Landing, there is an alternative development plan, Chris, that we just disagreed as far as I'm concerned, you know, with the approach that you wanted to take on this, and, and we're moving forward with that. So. So I believe that, that uh, you know, that if there's any modification, Russ, that you think would make clear on that, um, I believe, paragraph 11, um, that right of substitution, aside from that, I believe the agreement is uh, serves the intended purpose and that we need to get this moving, as the mayor's made multiple times the point, this has dragged on long enough, and, and, it, and the majority of it has been decided. So, Mr. Leach, I, I need clarification. Are you making a motion to amend uh, item number 11? Yeah, I would say, Russ, can you can you a draft a couple of words to make yeah to to make clear that he is <laughs> limited that it's his discretion if he wants to commit funds that we are going to pay him uh, in substitute. You know, yes, that is what I'm suggesting. So when you get it rewritten, yeah. if you would give it to us, we'll ask for a second and we'll go from there. Take your take your time. Yeah, it shouldn't take much. Yeah. If you guys could, don't mind us moving on here in the session. So we won't wait on you. Don't wait on me. Because I've got a few <laughs> minutes. That's all I have, man. All right. Thank you. Kim? Okay. Um, well, this is going to involve Russ. I'm, I know you're doing important work over there, so. Um, <laughs> when this was brought up before, Jack was hired as a, a non-exempt employee, part-time employee. That's what that means, right? He's going to get a paycheck then it was changed to 
because that wasn't going to work. And so we had to change it to 1099 because he couldn't meet the 1099 requirements. The original resolution as it was presented to council was um, as a non-exempt, here I'll pull it up. While you're pulling that up, I want to add to this. Employee that was getting a 1099 made no sense. Right. So, what I brought up at that time, when it was considered to hire him as a non-exempt employee, was that everything in the hiring process went against the city's stated hiring process. Every employee that gets hired has to follow, you know, the handbook, and there's a there's a process and how we do all that. That was all thrown out the window because we wanted, the mayor wanted to hire Jack for this. So then when I asked after it was already done, because I realized that there was gonna be a problem because he couldn't be paid like a 1099, he'd have to be paid with a paycheck. I called the city attorney, we had many conversations about it. But what he told me was that what council did in that resolution when we hired Mr. Mathers as a non-exempt employee was we threw out the, um, you know, all of our hiring procedures that every other employee that works for the city of Vienna has to follow, we, we threw that out. And the council, and we superseded that. And when we decided to um, pass the resolution hiring Mr. Mathers. Okay. So I said, well, I, I, I think this should have been probably a 1099. And he said, yes. And um, I said, doesn't that require a request for qualifications? Yes. It does. That's what I was told. And so the city, we never went out and put this out publicly to see who else can do this kind of work. There was no, we didn't do a matrix where we evaluated other people because we, I mean, nobody knew about it. We just picked somebody who, I mean, it's been mentioned many times, has a forestry service well, or forestry consulting, which that's fine. That's not economic development. That's not cultural development. That's not commercial development. None of that. And what the mayor read as a qualification was actually the North American industry classification system. And if you're not familiar with that, I am familiar with that because I own a corporation. When you go out to the Secretary of State's website and you have to fill in all your stuff, you have they have a system a standard that has a it's classification system. So that's already pre-filled. He didn't write that. That's, um, you know, that's a government thing. That's already done. So that, that's not a classification is what I'm trying to say, okay? Um, you know, I'm I, sure Mr. Mathers has lots of talents. We, all, we know that, but does he have the talent that, does he have the qualifications that we are asking for for this job, number one? And is he the best qualified? We don't know because we didn't ask anybody else, okay? But my main problem with this, um, this document, first of all, if I listened closely, I think that I heard it implied that Mr. Leach and, and the mayor wrote this, not our city attorney, and therefore the city attorney has reviewed it and made some edits, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that's not needed, and I... Um, you know, Mr. Mancuso will start his amending here in just a second. But what concerns me the most about this is that this is so broad and gives the mayor and, and Mr. Mather so much latitude. So many things will not be revealed to the public because they are going to happen behind closed doors. And there will not be any, you know, this decisions will be made. I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to happen. These decisions will be made. And then we'll come back to council say we need X amount of dollars to do X, Y, or Z at Spencer's Landing, and so council will have to approve that. That'll be the only thing that council will do, and I don't even tell you how the vote will probably work out. Be Chris and I probably voting no against it because it'll be something, because if we don't engage the community, and we didn't engage the community when we did the comprehensive plan, we haven't engaged, we didn't engage the community, well, when we did the pool, okay, because, I mean, we had a survey, but we had so many people who came out and said, hey, we want to have um, zero entry, we're older, or we have mobility problems. I know I said that. We had a, a woman who uh, has MS who came and said, please make it zero entry. Mm -mm, no, that didn't happen. So all this does, if you want more of the same, of things being decided in the dark without oversight from the public or council, that's what this is. 
That's, I mean, I can't make it any more plainer. And, but I do have a question about this. Number um, 16, identification. If I'm understanding this correctly, that, um, that neither party will hold each other harm, at harm, right? So this is an identification clause. Yep. Well, just one second before you answer. I understand. So I have a question. Does Mr. Mathers have errors and in admission insurance in case there is some harm? Okay, who, who comes back and pays for that? Um, I don't, because the city's not been, we've not been provided as council people any information whatsoever about his business. I went out to the Secretary of State's um, website and he has been in business for 2021. So, I mean, we don't, we don't know any, any other kind of um, qualifications or experience or anything like that. And so then it really concerns me because if there's no errors in admission insurance and then we've identified each other, I mean, what kind of position does that put the city in? Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm asking you. Okay. Um, mutual indemnification clauses are, are uh, pretty standard in, every, in any agreement. In fact, I put them in just about every agreement that we have uh, involving the city with any of outside of entity. entity. Um, we're always going to be responsible for our own conduct, negligent, um, you know, reckless, willful, uh, whether or not we have insurance coverage for those, um, you know, will depend on whatever the conduct or failure to act is. As far as Mr. Mathers, that's why we have the indemnification clause in here. We're not responsible for your, for his issues. Now, pragmatically speaking, if there was an issue, generally, um, the city's going to get sued, but this just gives uh, this gives part of the agreement to say that's to to our insurance carrier. Well, that's not our problem. That is that is his problem. And so if he doesn't have insurance, um, you know, it's going to be on him. So if there's a harm in some depending harm, on what the third, harm is, but yeah, I mean, I'm just in broad terms. And a third party comes out and says there was a harm. Mr. Mathers caused this harm, or, or I'm sorry, Mathers Forest consulting caused this harm and no insurance, no errors in emission insurance or whatever the case may be, then really the city's not going to be on the hook. I, oh, the city's going to be, uh, the city's going to, yeah. in my yeah, experience. But for the full thing is what I'm saying. In my experience, um, whatever you deal with uh, underinsured, uninsured, Somebody, the city is going to get sued, period. I mean, that's what it is. That's, that happens with anything. So the city's when the, officers, when the officers go out and do something, when the firemen go out and do something, when, uh, if, if you're doing it under the auspices of, uh, on behalf of the city, you're, well, I can assure you, you the city's going to get named a party. What this does is it requires the other party to, uh, to, uh, essentially take responsibility or ownership of that. Have we verified if I, this consulting firm has any insurance I have not verified okay. it. I, that's not, that's what tonight is for. Uh, I, and, I, and I don't, and I'm not meaning to be rude. For any of you folks that know me, I have the worst ADHD in the world and I'm losing my hearing. So whenever I, people talk and I have to write, I can't concentrate. <laughs> so if you guys don't mind, um, I'm going to step out and try to write this. Otherwise, I'm going to sit here and do this in circles for the next half hour. Well, Kim, well, that's the point. The, uh, on the indemnification agreement, the, the, you know, it, it's interesting to me that you didn't bring any of these points up because there's not even an indemnification agreement with the Economic Development Authority Agreement. Uh, you're bringing up a bunch of issues that never even mattered. Uh, in this first agreement that we did, and I just wonder why that is. So, I can tell you why that is. The indemnification agreement is standard. Um, if we want to look and see whether there's an insurance agreement, I'm sure we can ask Jack that, but it's just, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is what's called respondeat superior, and that means that the city is responsible for the conduct of all its employees, whether it's public works, parks department, um, et cetera. It is a cost of doing business. And the fact that we have an indemnification agreement in this contract with this independent contractor is simply a level of protection greater than anywhere else that we have. Because if he had been a W-2 employee, then there would be no such provision at all. So, uh, you know, so to, to, to pick on it here and then also to say that it's somehow uh, less desirable when, in fact, it gives the city more protection... Uh, than if he were a simple uh, you know, W-2 employee. 
um, you know, is, and, and you know, anyway, so that's the point I had to make about it. All right. So we have two of our council members that are calling in. Um, I personally am not comfortable continuing this discussion without our city attorney here. Um, but I hesitate to take a break until he comes back simply because um, Roger and Jim, if we if we take a 10 minute break till Russ gets his paperwork up to speed, are we going to lose either one of you? No, I'll be good, Mayor. All right. Jim, what about you? I'm good. All right. And we'll call a 10 minute recess and we'll be back as soon as Russ gets that paperwork straightened up. Sure, they can do it any night. Absolutely.